And now, Joe Bob Summer School and Forbidden Planet on TNT. There were just too many famous people to talk about in that movie. Sylvia Sidney, the 30s glamour girl, she was the crazy grandma. The French president was director Barbette Schroeder. Um, even the waiter who brought Natalie Portman the pizza was a novelist named Julian Barnes. I think Tim Burton maybe should have spent a little less time on casting cameos and a little more on some momentum for the story, but his movies never pay too much attention to story anyway, now that I think about it. Jersey Skolomowski, he's in the movie. He played Dr. Ziegler. You guys know who Jersey Skolomowski is? No. Only the greatest director in Poland. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. All right. I want to let you know that next week, Joe Bob's Summer School is going on a special field trip for Food Science 504. You're not going to believe this one. We're going to the world-famous restaurant Spago in Beverly Hills, California, where the one and only Wolfgang Puck is going to teach me how to cook. And we'll be watching the classic Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory and the Clint Howard gross-out horror flick, The Ice Cream Man. And Clint Howard himself will be here. And speaking of yummy... Our next movie is the 1956 cult favorite that stars Anne Francis in many leg-bearing, futuristic mini-dresses. <laughs> Anne Francis may have invented the mini-dress, now that I think about that. You didn't have many girls dressed like this in the 50s. I'm talking about, of course, Forbidden Planet, and Anne will be joining us in a little while to give us all the dirt on Leslie Nielsen and Robbie the Robot. The movie takes place in 2200 A.D. when Nielsen and a crew of whiskey-loving, horny astronauts land on a planet where the only survivor of a previous colonization is Walter Pigeon and his luscious virginal daughter, who doesn't mind making out with crew members in the bushes, even though an invisible monster is tearing people to shreds. Let's do those drive-in totals. We have... Seven dead bodies, one dead tiger, two naked butocks, female this time, brain boosting, door melting, gratuitous underground tour, electron foo, and we're showing it in letterbox format because it was shot in widescreen cinemascope, so I hope your TV's not as dinky as mine is. <laughs> it's a pretty cool movie. I give it three and a half stars, subtracting a half star only for those scenes without Anne Francis in them. Check it out. And like I said, Ann will be joining us in just a little bit. That naked butock count, that's been going up lately. Have you noticed that? You guys <laughs> seen that? This is like the fourth set of butocks we've had in summer school alone. I think that TNT butock patrol in Atlanta has loosened up a little bit, you know? Okay, you screwed up again, didn't you? It's your fifth year in junior college. Your life has no possibility of improving. Not true if you attend yet another session of Joe Bob's Summer School, nine brain-expanding Saturday nights good for actual credit at Southern Arizona State Community College at Ajo. But you need to enroll your hiney. To register, you got to go to the summer school website and get a syllabus, plus you'll be able to see who some of our guest lecturers are this summer, and you'll also get a sneak peek at a few of the final exam questions, and you can even include yourself in our summer yearbook, listing your worst subject and favorite hobbies. The internet address for Joe Bob's Summer school is tnt.turner.com forward slash summer school. That doesn't mean you can skip the dang class. Of course, even academic probation is fun at Joe Bob's Summer School Saturday nights on Turner National Technical Institute. Visit Joe Bob's Summer School at tnt.turner.com forward slash summer school. Back to Joe Bob's Summer School and Forbidden Planet on TNT. The famous Robbie the Robot, which caused a sensation back in 1956. We tried to find Robbie and have him on the show, but we think he's been bought by some Japanese guys. Because my friend Mick Garris, the director of many Stephen King films, directed The Stand, he used to own Robbie and keep him in good working condition. And, well, he never really was in very good working condition. <laughs> I think they kind of shoved him around from inside somewhere in Robbie. But Mick sold Robbie, and we can't... Oh, we have him? We have Robbie? All right, I'm, I'm going to talk to him at the break. We may have Robbie here. Anyhow, that's Leslie Nielsen as the commander. Uh, you know, Leslie's now a household name for the Naked Gun movies, but you notice that he acts the same in these early serious movies as in Naked Gun? You just change the writing a little bit, and suddenly he's doing comedy. <laughs> but he never really changed. Okay, I don't want to kill too much time here because we got Anne Francis coming out at the next break, so roll film. And by the way, who here knows what a philologist is? I'll give you a hint. A philologist 
would know what a philologist is. <laughs> of course, if, if the philologist wasn't called a philologist, if it was called something equally complex, would the philologist still know what a philologist is? Yes, they would. Or would a philologist by any other name still be a philologist? I don't know. Okay, I'll tell you. A philologist is an expert in philology. First, there was my TNT Monster Vision website with the famous caption contest, which is still going strong, I might add. Then we added the incredibly sexy Monster Vision t-shirt, coveted by would-be prize winners everywhere. Then we added the Find That Flick contest, in which you can win all kinds of free junk just by knowing the plots of weird movies. And now we proudly present Joe Bob's Summer School website, which is the perfect companion to my summer-long movie lineup on TNT. Well, not the perfect companion. Jennifer Lopez would be the perfect companion. But my point is, I'm slowly building an empire here at TNT. It's no longer possible to take me lightly. And I'll take just as much time as I want with this promo. OK, to find out your class assignments and guest lecturers, get on the information superhighway and drive to tnt.turner.com forward slash summer school. And Enroll at Joe Bob Summer School now at tnt.turner.com forward slash summer school. Back to Joe Bob Summer School and Forbidden Planet on TNT. The words we've all been waiting for, father. <laughs> Did I do that right? The first words of Anne Francis as Altera Morbius, the lust-inspiring daughter of Walter Pigeon. And this is where the movie gets really interesting. And this room also just got interesting because live in person with us tonight is the cult heartthrob herself, Anne Francis. So welcome, Anne. I know I did that first line terrible. It's sort of... No, it's more, father. Yes, okay. <laughs> father. And that famous dress you're wearing, what kind of planning went into that dress? That was planning, studio planning. Yes? Yes. And what were they yes. going for and, there? They had one outfit that Dory Sherry's wife, Virginia Sherry, wouldn't allow us to use because she said it was too sexy. You mean they were going for, you, there was a more revealing outfit no, 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 that, no, no, no. that we didn't no, get to see? No, 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 no. It was silver from the neck all the way down. It was just, it was sort of like a silver lame all the way down with silver boots. And then there was a, a silver hood that came. Everything was com completely covered. But she and then over that uh, was um, a coat that was uh, see-through plastic coat. And silver gloves. And too so sexy. they thought that was too sexy, and they went for the shortest mini dress in the history of mo motion pictures <laughs> yeah. up to that time. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever wear that, that dress in public? No. Like to a promotional event oh, or anything? They, no, no, they wouldn't have let it out of the studio. Okay, I gotta yeah. ask you this. What? Were you really madly in love with Leslie Nielsen? Of course. Yeah? Sure, why not? Did you have he a, was gorgeous. a hot love affair oh, with Leslie course, on the oh, set? Of course, of course. I thought he was fabulous. Yeah? And I, I was madly in love with him before I met him because I'd seen him do wonderful, wonderful work on live television, you know, back in the days when... Yeah. It, which I had come from before I came out to Are you the still studios. good friends today? Sure. Haven't seen him for quite a while, but uh, we've done a couple of shows since then together. Yeah. yeah. Great guy. Well, this, is your, this was your very first role. And, of course, among your most famous roles. But you're really also well known for a particular Twilight Zone episode. Do many people ask you about that? I'm sure they do. We go from father to Marsha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's no. the one where you're, you're a mannequin. After who comes, hours, yes. Who comes yes, to the life. mannequin who uh, comes to life and doesn't remember that she's a mannequin and goes to the store to buy a, a, a gold thimble for her mother. And then she gets embroiled in a horrific experience of being on the 13th floor and yeah the whole well the place beautiful mannequin kind who, of like this <laughs> yeah. okay. well the beautiful mannequin who comes to life is kind of an evergreen story that's uh, been used many times in the movies and always takes like the they take the most gorgeous girl in hollywood at the time and do the mannequin story oh, you're so kind. <laughs> we'll talk more with our special guest lecturer Anne Francis at the next break but let's get back to forbidden planet and um, whatever happened to that Anne Francis mannequin, by the way? That what they used Anne it? Francis mannequin? The Anne Francis mannequin in the Twilight Zone episode. Oh my gosh, you had me going for a second there. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, there was oh an Anne God. Francis mannequin in the Twilight Zone episodes. You know, it's probably a collector's item today, right? Well, I, I have the um, I have the head that was originally done. You have the head? Yes, it's sitting on top of my dresser in my bedroom. Oh. 
but well, you, you don't know, want the something like that kit. getting into the wrong hands. I'm glad that you have it. I sprayed you know, it cold. Well, you, you, you know what? You could put it in put your car. I should put a mirror around it. <laughs> no, you could put it in your car and use the uh, carpool link. You're right. That's a good idea. <laughs> I will put it on. A, that's a Twin great sisters. idea. Great idea. <laughs> Want to win a free video of some obscure horror movie you've never heard of that some guy in West Virginia made in his basement? Of course you do. That's why umpteen jillion people have discovered our Find That Flick contest. If you've never heard of it, forget it. It's too complicated to explain on TV. But you can find out all about it on our MonsterVision website at tnt.turner.com forward slash MonsterVision. And I'll give you one clue. If you're one of those guys who never leaves his apartment except to rent videos, this contest was designed to give heretofore unrealized meaning to your life. Play the Find That Flick contest at tnt.turner.com forward slash monster vision. Back to Joe Bob Summer School and Forbidden Planet on TNT. Well, we're seeing more and more of why Anne Francis is so popular in this movie. Because there you were making out with Jack Kelly, probably best known as Bart Maverick. Yep. And, uh... <laughs> By the way, Ann, since this is UFO Studies 666 tonight, that's our topic, I want to ask you, do you believe in any kind of other life out there? No, I'm just getting over 666, that number. <laughs> it was a little joke we made about UFO studies, you know. I see. Do I believe there's any life out there? Yeah. Well, I've seen things out there, but then you know me. I can yeah. see things, you know. Well, well, remember when they had all that big hullabaloo about Phoenix, Arizona and the flaming lights in the sky. I've yeah. seen that out over Palm Desert where I live. Up When I've been up in the mountains and up in Pinion Crest, I've seen that. And I've seen one silver disc out there. So yeah, I'm, something's going on. I, well, you actually had an, ex an eerie experience with some kind of ghost, right, when your daughter was little? What, what was that about? That has absolutely nothing at all to do with Forbidden Planet. Well, we've done a little research. We want to ask you about other it's things, It's too Anne. long and too involved to tell you, Joba. All right. But you have daughters, right? I have two wonderful daughters. Are they, are they as good? Both healthy. Yeah? And are they, well. Are they as good looking as you? They're gorgeous. Yeah? All right. Well, let's talk about... By the way, I wanted to refresh your memory. Here's the mannequin. Starlog magazine. Yes. Here's the mannequin. You've yes. forgotten about this mannequin. I haven't mannequin. forgotten about that oh, mannequin, okay. but when you said the Anne Francis mannequin, that's mannequin, that's a Marsha mannequin. Oh, okay. It's a difference. And also, here's that silver lame jumpsuit that was that was regarded as too sexy for <laughs> Forbidden Planet. All right, let's talk about your TV show, Honey West, for a minute. It was on in 1965, and one of the things I remember is that your lace garter belt was a gas mask. Now, there you're wrong. Somebody no? told you that because I never had a lace garter belt that was a gas mask, so there. Really? Never. Who gave I you saw that the belt? episode That's where Debbie. You're... She gave you false information. No. <laughs> she read the books instead of watching the show. I would never have had a garter belt that was a, that gas, was a gas mask. mask. We had all be... kinds of gadgets on the show, right? Yeah, but... And you're... work with me a little bit, no, okay? No, no, no. Not when you All say right, these well, things. Well, describe the character for me then. I'll just listen. She was fun loving. She was adventurous. She was a lady detective. She had a marvelous time. All the bad guys she, you know, would kick in the butt. And, um,. All the good guys she'd save, and uh, she knew karate. She had uh, an ocelot cat named Bruce. Bit of trivia Everyone there. Everyone remembers the ocelot. No, that's not and, trivia. That's well, a major the name part of the Bruce show. is trivia because nobody oh, okay. remembers his name. Bruce the ocelot. Bruce and the, the network canceled the show. And he had a stand-in. Yeah. And the network canceled the show after only one season because they could uh, buy the rights to the Avengers for they could less get the than Avengers. it cost to make the show. Yeah. But uh, people still talk about the show, and isn't it back yeah. on on one it's of on the TV land? Well, the, you don't want to talk TV about TV land. land okay, I don't one, think. Of the, one of the we cable might. networks. <laughs> okay, we're going to see what new dress Robbie the robot makes for Anne as we continue with Forbidden Planet. Didn't you name your dog after Walter Pigeon? Walter, don't tell me that's not true. Walter Smidgen was his name. Walter Smidgen. And okay. I was down in Palm Springs visiting uh, with Smidge along with me, and somebody who thought they were being very cute said that I was visiting so-and-so at such-and-such place in Palm Springs with Walter Pigeon. Oh. That caused quite a stir, especially with Mrs. Pigeon. Did you like Walter? 
You're very nosy, aren't you? Was he, was I did he... not have an affair with Walter Pigeon, no. <laughs> I didn't he played think my had... father, remember? Well, I know, but it, well, it would have been difficult to have an affair with Walter Pigeon while you were having an affair with Leslie Nielsen. I know, but... <laughs> and then there was Jack Kelly, too, so, Jack you know. Kelly, you're sure. making out with him. Oh, oh sure. Anyway, but you named your dog Walter Smidgen. That could uh -huh. be con considered a tribute or it could be considered, you know. Well, Smidgen was his name, and I chose Walter for his first name for obvious reasons. I thought okay. it was funny. I do know but a woman. But now that I look back, it wasn't. Oh. I know a woman who calls her dog Joe Bob, but, uh, and I know several women who call Joe Bob a dog, but uh, we won't go into that. Back to Joe Bob Summer School and Forbidden Planet on TNT. Something sabotaged the Klystron generator, not to mention the gyro stabilizer. What was all that stuff, Ann? Do you remember? All that techno jargon. That what was, was all a, that about? That was all wonderful stuff that was in the script, Joe Bob. <laughs> okay, a Rod Serling script, by the way. Professor Joe Bob here. No, I wasn't. Rod Serling and someone else. Right? Rod Serling? No, Rod Serling did not. It was uh, Cyril Hume who wrote the script. What? Planet of the Apes. I'm sorry, I'm getting all my movies mixed up this summer on Joe Bob's Summer School. <laughs> Professor Joe Bob here with Anne Francis, who plays Altera in Forbidden Planet. Anne, you are such a flirt in this movie. Yes. Were you naked in that lagoon? Of course not. Okay, of I don't mean to offend not. you. You look no. naked. They made you look naked. They I did a good know, job. No, but if with you look fast as I'm coming out of the lagoon, you can see it. A, a, a wisp of, of pale, sort of pinkish chiffon in the breeze. Quick! You have to look quickly. Okay. <laughs> How was it working with the robot, Robbie the robot? Oh, Robbie was wonderful. He but was... I hear he got really drunk. Oh, you time. know something? You just are full of stories, aren't you? You're just full of all kinds now, of information. Now, come on. This is a famous story. This is a famous story. It became famous when I opened my mouth and told it once. And from then on, it's just become... Robbie the robot got drunk. There were right? two. Well, there were two different guys who worked inside Robbie the robot. Because working inside Robbie the robot, in defense of this one fellow, it was a very tough job. It was hot inside there. It was really rough. And uh, this one day, he he had a couple of martinis for lunch. And when he got back in the suit, there's a scene, you know, where, where Robbie walks away from this, the, 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 the big kind of Jeep van kind of thing that he's attached to. Mm -hmm. And when he was walking away, uh, something happened and his, his feet kind of went like this, like on an incline, and he started going this way downward. And about 15 grips got him before he hit the ground because he was the most expensive actor in the show he cost a million dollars to put oh. together that was important so stuff that was the, a so drunken he, actor you can replace but the guy almost a robot ruined, you can't replace ruin the robot suit okay yeah, well yeah. let's go back to the movie because that was a really short segment we'll 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 talk <laughs> again at the next segment how many times have you actually watched this movie do you know, I haven't really watched it that often, but I just saw it at the Los Angeles Theater a couple of weeks ago on CinemaScope. We had 2,100 people there. We had the greatest really? time. Yeah, and it was fun. Did I, you I find that it. you remembered it? Do you know it by heart? Yeah, pretty much so. Okay, then sure. which is it? The Klystron generator or the Klystron oh, no, transmitter? Oh, that part I didn't have to memorize, <laughs> Joe Bob. I, that part was not, not my responsibility. Okay. When you enter the caption contest and you don't win, do not write us a letter saying his caption sucks. Let's be good sports about this, okay? After all, the only reason you're so angry is that the stakes are so low. One measly Monster Vision t-shirt. Because if the prize is that cheap and you don't win it, it kind of brings into question your potential in all areas, right? But let's not dwell on that. If you think your caption is hilarious, then come on down to the website and try to make the six-headed jury laugh. That address is tnt.turner.com forward slash Monster Vision. And here's a tip. Think sixth grade humor. We love that. Try to win a free t-shirt in our caption contest on the one and only Monster Vision website at tnt.turner.com forward slash Monster Vision. Back to Joe Bob Summer School and Forbidden Planet on TNT. Wow, this is a talky movie, you know? Do they have to give the whole history of Krell civilization? 
Anyway, we have a special treat for our guest lecturer, Anne Francis. So uh, let me let me give a little history about Robbie the Robot. I want to get this out of the way first before we do our special presentation. But Robbie was such a hit in Forbidden Planet in 1956 that he did another movie the following year called The Invisible Boy. And he also appeared in many TV shows throughout the years, including Lost in Space and The Twilight Zone and even The Love Boat. And in 1970, MGM sold Robbie the Robot at uh, an auction to a prop museum where he proceeded to get vandalized over time by these wrongdoing hoodlums. And then in 1974, Robbie was restored by a guy named Fred Barton. And sometime after that, my pal Mick Garris, the director of The Stand, bought Robbie and put him in his house, I think. And then Mick then sold Robbie to Bill Malone, another director who just directed the remake of House on Haunted Hill. And then we think that Bill sold him to some kind of Japanese touring sci-fi exhibit. But guess who has the licensing rights to Robbie? Who bought all the old MGM films a few years ago? Ted Turner, Turner right? So Turner Entertainment has the rights to Robbie the Robot. And we used our pull to arrange for a very special reunion tonight. Anne Francis, your old friend, Robbie the Robot. How about this? Robbie the Robot, what do you think? She's so happy, she doesn't know what to say. Robbie the Robot, just like you remember him, right? And uh, we spent a lot of money getting him here, so I hope it was worth it. I think he's been using the Thigh Master. <laughs> he's he's hey. a little thinner down here than I remember. Oh, 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 okay, what's going on? What's going on? You couldn't get the robot, right? I asked for the robot, I asked for the robot so many times that you told me you had the robot. It's one of those Time Warner bureaucracy things, right? Don't we have the rights to the robot. Ann, I'm so embarrassed. I know, but don't get I'm upset. So it's all right, it's they all right. This. It's a nice robot. What do you know? Don't hurt its feelings. You try to cover it up with this. You don't know the kind like of people Frankie. I work for here. He's beautiful. I don't know why robot, he... He's it... not that tall, is he? Robbie the robot is about six no. feet, you know? Robbie's about this tall, and he did not have black rubber gloves. God I knows so. what they're for. Don't you dum-dums know that? Good grief. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, that's Amber. Right. Thanks that's so much right. for coming uh, by. Let's get back to the movie. And uh, it's, it's humiliating to do that kind of thing to me. The gorgeous Anne Francis, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. It's Are you fun. single, Anne? Yeah. Oh. So, Still well, available. what does that mean? Just had to find out before oh, I you see. leave. Oh, okay. Okay, fire away. I can take it. Hit me with your best shot. You're going to reduce me to tears, aren't you? You're going to emasculate me with your mail, as usual. But if you got something to say about tonight's movie, or me, or the mail girl, or the war in Kosovo, then I invite you, because I am a masochist, to contact me at my personal email address, monstervision at turner.com, or you can visit the MonsterVision website at tnt.turner.com forward slash MonsterVision and send a crushing mean-spirited email from there. Or you can even do it the old-fashioned way by sending a letter to MonsterVision, care of TNT Programming, 1010 Techwood Drive, Atlanta, Georgia, 30318. So I've given you three ways to nuke me. I would remind you, God is watching what you write. Visit the MonsterVision website at tnt.turner.com forward slash MonsterVision. Back to Joe Bob Summer School and Forbidden Planet on TNT. Most Forbidden Planet fans would know that the movie is based on Shakespeare's play, The Tempest. You guys all knew that, right? It's based on The Tempest. Dr. Morbius, he's Prospero, the magician who controls the action in the play. Uh, Altera is his daughter, Miranda, in Shakespeare. Uh, Commander Adams, Leslie Nielsen's role, he's Prince Ferdinand in the play. Robbie the Robot is Caliban, the earthly spirit. The monster is Ariel. And I won't say why that's the monster, because that'll, you know, give away the ending of the movie. Oh, no! I ruined it, didn't I? You know the ending now, because I told you that Ariel is the monster. It's the same as the Tempest. Leon is over here bawling like a baby, because I ruined the surprise. Even the minor characters in the movie are based on the play, like the, like the cook with a taste for the sauce. He matches uh, Stefano, the drunken servant in The Tempest. So, and that's the veteran actor Earl Holloman in that role, best known as Angie Dickinson's sidekick on Police Woman and many movies, Sharky's Machine. He was also in the original Twilight Zone episode, the one where he wanders around a deserted city the whole time, and then you find out he's part of a test to see how humans respond to being alone in spaceflight. The original Twilight Zone. 
Anybody who was anybody in those days got to do a Twilight Zone. Okay, let's keep it going. Back to the movie. Forbidden Planet is actually, it's actually based on Shakespeare's play and Freud's concept of a tripartite psyche. Would you like me to explain the tripartite psyche? I didn't think so. Back to Joe Bob Summer School and Forbidden Planet on TNT. What a great way to save special effects money. The creature is invisible. It's a giant four-footed arboreal killer sloth, right? But you can't see it. So genius. But it's no wonder the crew of the spaceship couldn't kill the monster because they're only hitting it with three billion electron volts. That is a minuscule amount, like subatomic physics kind of minuscule. Three billion of them wouldn't be enough to cook a snail. You hit a grain of sand with three billion electron volts, you don't even see a difference. All right, time for the exciting Shakespearean slash Freudian conclusion to Forbidden Planet. Go. Three billion electron volts. I need that much just to do this, watch. Is my left eyebrow moving? See, I need more than three billion. Guess I need, all right, full power. You know what that was? That was about 100 trillion electron volts. Back to Joe Bob Summer School and Forbidden Planet on TNT. Well, that was a little confusing there at the end, wasn't it? The Krell used an underground power plant to create little Princess Leia holograms, but they forgot about their own lust for destruction, the monsters of the id which don't like strange men talking to daddy's little girl, do they? See, not only does this movie employ Freud's concept of the tripartite psyche, the id, the ego, and the superego, it also utilizes the archetypal Electra pattern, the female equivalent of Oedipus, or in layman's terms, it's that incest thing. And speaking of the Princess Leia hologram, this movie no doubt is where George Lucas got the idea for that scene in Star Wars. Because when he was creating Star Wars, he watched tons of old sci-fi flicks, including Forbidden Planet. And you can also trace R2-D2 and C-3PO back to Robbie the Robot. And would somebody get rid of this thing while I'm talking about Robbie the Robot? Anyhow, I want to thank Stanton T. Friedman and Ann Francis for stopping by tonight. Also, let me remind you that next week's summer school course is Food Science 504, and we'll be taking a field trip to the famous Spago in Beverly Hills so Wolfgang Puck can teach me how to take something out of the oven while it's still edible. And we'll be watching the food classics Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory and the Ice Cream Man, and uh, Clint Howard will be dropping by, too. So that's it for me, Professor Joe Bob, wondering... If a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to see it, do the other trees make fun of it? <laughs> Did you guys hear the one about this guy, Jake? This guy, Jake, is struggling through a bus station with these two huge suitcases when a stranger walks up to him and says, have you got the time? So Jake puts down the two suitcases and he looks at his wrist and he tells the stranger, uh, it's a quarter to six. And the stranger says, hey, that's a pretty fancy watch. And Jake brightens up just a little bit and says, yeah, it's not bad, check this out. And he shows him a time zone display, not just for every time zone in the world, but for the 86 largest cities in the world. He hits a few buttons on his watch, and from somewhere on the watch, this voice says, the time is 11 till 6. But it says it in a West Texas accent. Then a few more buttons, and the same voice says something in Japanese. And Jake says to the guy, yeah, I put in regional accents for each city on my watch. And the display on the watch is unbelievable high quality. The voice is amazing. The stranger, he's dumbstruck. And Jake says, well, that's not all if you really want to see the watch. And he pushes a few more buttons, and this tiny but very high-resolution map of New York City appears on the display. And he tells the guy, the flashing dot, see, shows our location by satellite positioning. And then he says, view recede 10. And the display changes to show eastern New York State. Well, the stranger tells him, I want to buy this watch. And Jake says, oh, no, no, it's not ready for sale yet. I'm still working out all the bugs in it. But look at this. And he demonstrates that the watch is also a pretty decent little FM radio receiver with a digital tuner, and it has a sonar device on it that can measure distances up to 125 meters, a pager with thermal paper printout, 
and most impressive of all, the capacity for voice recordings of up to 300 standard size books. And he says, but I only have 32 of my favorites in there so far, you know, Jake tells me. And the stranger says, I got to have this watch. And Jake says, no, you don't understand. It's not ready. And the stranger says, I'll give you $1,000 for the watch. And Jake says, oh, no, I've already spent more than that developing the watch. And he says, I'll give you 5000 for it. And Jake goes, oh, but it's just not. And he says, I'll give you $15,000 for this watch. The stranger pulls out his checkbook, and Jake thinks about it in a minute, and he's only invested about $8,500 in materials and development. With $15,000, he can make another watch and have it ready for merchandising in six months or so. So the stranger frantically finishes writing out the check, and he waves it in front of him, and he says, here it is, and I'm ready to hand it to you right now, $15,000. Take it or leave it. And Jake says, okay, and he peels off the watch, and they make the exchange, and the stranger starts away happily with his new watch, and Jake calls out to him, hey, wait a minute. And he turns around, the stranger turns around, looks at him, and Jake points to the two suitcases he'd been trying to wrestle through the bus station. He says, don't forget your batteries. <laughs> Joe Bob Briggs reminding you that the drive-in will never die. That was a long mother of a joke, wasn't it? Okay, a black guy, a white guy, a Catholic priest, a Lutheran minister, a rabbi, a hooker, a chicken, a football player, a baseball player, a wife, a husband, a Pole, a Russian, a little boy, a dog, a drunk, an Irishman, St. Peter, and a penguin walk into a bar. The bartender says, what is this, a joke? <laughs> Two peanuts are walking down the street. One is assaulted. <laughs>